Hello everyone! Today I am starting this video with a very scary looking figure. I will be showing you how to go from this to this. So if that is of interest to you, stay tuned and I will walk you through the steps in this video. So let's go ahead and read in our data frame here. You'll see we have 300 observations spread across four variables. And these are organized according to genus, food, and the correlations between a given food and its genus. So you'll see I only have two, let's call them participants, in this data frame, each of which has a set of correlations. Now what I want to do is I want to take the mean of the correlations across the two participants. And we're doing this so that we can then consolidate these data and be able to visualize them in a heat map. So to do this ordering, you're going to go ahead and load your dplyr package. And then we're going to group by genus and food. And we're going to summarize our core for correlation variable. And we're going to call this mean underscore core. So you'll see now I have a new data frame that's made of 150 observations. And that makes sense because as you remember, I mentioned we have only two participants in this data set. And because we are taking the mean, then we are essentially reducing our data frame by half. So if I go ahead and visualize this, you'll be able to see that we no longer have our ID column here. Instead, we have ordered by the genus and food, and now we have this variable here that represents the mean correlation across our two participants. So for the next steps, to actually create the heat, heat map, we're going to use a couple packages. And let's load these. Okay. So what does a very, very simple heat map look like? Essentially, let's, let's call this into a heat map. We're going to be using ggplot this is the name of our data frame, and then we are specifying what our x and y values are. So that would be the food variable for our x value, the genus for our y value, and then we're going to fill the heat map so that the tiles represent the value of the mean correlation. The geom underscore tile, this is actually what creates the heat map. So. This is essentially what I showed you at the beginning of the video. And this is how the heat map looks like without making any changes to it. Now, of course, this isn't ready for publication necessarily. So let's see what we can do to improve this. So I do have here the overall code. And you can go ahead and take a look. I have the explanations associated with most of the codes here on what they do, but let's actually go through it together. So what you'll see here in this heat map is these are ordered alphabetically. So if I want to reverse the order that you see here on the screen, what I can do is I can replace my y equal genus with this function right here. And so let's go ahead and see what this gives us. I'm going to actually show you this step by step. So I'm just going to hide these for a second. And if I go ahead and run this command, you'll see that the order has now reverted. And now this is sorted alphabetically. Now, what does this do here? Let's go back. So if I wanted to add breaks between the tiles vertically, then I can use this function here and I can say I want these vertical lines to be white in color. These two functions here represent the width essentially of this line. And so this is what it would look like. Now, I don't think I want that for the final output. So I'm going to go ahead and set this back to zero. And I'll keep the explanations below, but let me delete them from here just so that it's a little bit more tidy. 
Okay, so what else do we want to do here in this figure? Let me start by looking at the overall theme. So you see here, it's, it's kind of faint. If I zoom in, it's probably easier to see. There's a brief shaded gray background, but we can actually remove this. Okay, so if I go ahead and actually just run this as such with the classic theme, now you'll see that the shaded background is gone, but we have gained a vertical and a horizontal line and the ticks still remain here. So if we want to remove these, then we can apply more specifications to our code. Okay, so what I am specifying here is within this theme, I don't necessarily want to keep the lines, the ticks. I also went ahead and changed the size of my legend title. So here you'll see that it's a little bit large um, and we can, we can change the, the size here. And then one other thing I did is as you notice, and this is the non-magnified version, but even if we go ahead and zoom in, you'll see that there is some overlap with the x-axis titles. And so what we can do here is I can actually rotate these labels so that they are at a 45 degree angle. So it's already looking much, much better. You see we have our 45 angle labels here. The legend title is now a little bit smaller. Now I want to also remove the titles of my X and Y axis. I don't believe they are serving a purpose here necessarily. So let's go ahead and do that. And this is a simple function that I have here. And now these are gone. And so what else can we do here? I mean, the color speaks for itself. It's a very loud color palette that we have here. It's kind of scary looking, so we can change that. We can also change the dimensions of this legend board right here. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so here I've specified what I want the bar width and the bar height to be. So you'll see this will change momentarily. And then I've also identified that I want to change the name of the legend from mean underscore core to correlation. I have specific color palettes that I've uh, slotted in here into the code. And then this limits equal C zero NA. What this means is that I am adding the zero value here at the bottom of the legend bar and the NA represents essentially infinity according to the data that we are working with. There we go. So you see here the changes that have happened with the legend, the gradient, as well as the color palette. So I'm looking at this now and I see it's a much improved version of what we had before. What you may want to do as well is change the actual dimensions of the heat map. So you see here it looks, it resembles a square and we can actually play around with that a little bit. We can make it more, more tight or more spread apart. And I can do this using the chord underscore fixed function. So this is what 0 0.5 gives you. Let's see what this would look like with a 0 0.7. So this is a little bit more compact, whereas the 0 0.5 was more of a rectangular spread apart shape. 
let's see what a ratio of 1 would give us. And this is a little bit similar to what we had in the beginning. So I actually like the 0.5 for the type of data that we have here today. So, so let's go ahead with this one. Now, the other thing I would like to add here is actually the correlations that we have. So when you look at this figure, you'll see we do have the gradient. However, it may be a little bit challenging to identify which tiles are actually colored differently than their neighbors. So some of them are quite striking and, and you'll notice that they are different from one another. For example, this one right here compared to this one. But if I look at this compared to its neighbor up here, it's a little bit harder to tell. So what I can do is I can actually overlay the mean correlations, the numbers, over each of these tiles. And I do this using the geom underscore text function. So I do have a note here that the format function, typically what you could do is you can actually go without this format. You could do label equal round, mean underscore core, two decimal places. However, we add this format and the end small function because you'll see in a second some of the numbers that we have could have a decimal of zero. And if the decimal is zero, then not having the format would not capture it and it would list it as 0 0.7 as opposed to 0 0.70, for example. So adding these extra functions allows us to have the whole two decimal places. The size controls the actual size of the font that we are using to overlay these correlations and the color is the color that we would like to associate with the text. Again, just making this a little bit tidy since I do have the explanations below. There we go. Now you'll see that this bar, this gradient, is actually quite large. However, when you zoom into the picture, you'll see that the size is actually appropriate compared to the heat map that we have. All right, so it's looking pretty good. Now I'd like to show you one final thing here down below. If you didn't have your own colors, you could essentially work with pre-existing simple colors starting with white as your low and another color that you identify as your high. And these refer to the lows and highs across the gradients. You can also use existing palettes like this pink shade palette right here. You can download other packages that have their own palettes as well, like this one. So you can really just see what you like and go with that. I will revert back to the purple shade here. So again, what we did today is we went from this original heat map, no modifications, and we improved it to now look like this. So I hope you found this tutorial helpful. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them down below and I will see you in the next video with more statistics. Thank you so much for watching.